Hello, rock stars and rat packs. My name is TV Sky, and uh, I've been working on Elden Ring episodes. I promise I have. I wanted that to be the next thing I put out, but well, then Riot just had to go and release the Heart Steel single, didn't they? I'd watched the World's uh, Anthem thing that they put out for this year, and I was. I would say I was decidedly unimpressed with it. Like, the song is fine, but the music video was, in my view, very sort of boring and perfunctory. It seemed more to be going through the motions than to have any actual real idea for visual storytelling. I find, like, it was sort of like, eh. And so I figured, like, maybe, maybe Heartsteel, like, it's going to be an attempt to replicate KDA. Maybe it's not going to be that good. Maybe I'm not going to bother with it. But no, it's, it's really fucking good. Like, the single is... Not really my kind of music. I don't want to comment on it. They seems to be doing very well in the streaming numbers, but the music video is... <sighs> I mean, it also has problems, and we'll get into those, but the fundamental craft of what's going on here, the fucking character animation that they've got going on, the, the playfulness that they exhibit with the visual style of this thing... Oh, it's too good. Like, I <laughs> I couldn't resist. I had to. I had to talk about it. And I can show you right now why I had to talk about it, because we, we just came across it uh, just a moment ago. You may not have noticed it, but your brain did. Did you see that? Did you see why we have to talk about it? Did you see it? Let me play this very slowly in reverse. That's why. There it is. That's, we have, that's why we have to talk about it. It's because this is... Keyframe animation. This is this is fully hand animated, really good, cartoony, using all of the tools in the toolbox, character acting that they've got going on here. And I am the world's biggest sucker for this exact thing. Now, this is not going to be as polished as the arcane animation breakdown that I put out recently, the three hour long one. Uh... It's not going to be a structured, we are just going to go through this thing and talk about all of the stuff that's happening and all of the stuff that I think is cool about it, and enjoy ourselves. We're just going to have a good time with some real goddamn good animation. Um, now, Heartsteel suffer in the comparison to KDA, and I say that because KDA was like this impossible, out-of-nowhere, global mega-hit of a song, um, like like a genuine, actual chart chart single um with a hugely influential and impressive musical that shifted the direction of a lot of things internally at riot one of the things people don't know is that riot internally there was a big fight about whether to try and do a k-pop thing like they, it was something that a lot of people at Riot was like, what the fuck do you mean kids we have gamers we don't they don't want k-pop like who, who cares about this like there was a lot of doubt internally and a lot of fighting internally about what whether to commit that much um to something like KDA, and it turns out, yeah, no, no shit, it turns out it was a good idea, uh, which we can tell in hindsight. Um, and as far as I know, there's been a little bit of the same thing with Heartsteel. It's been a little bit of the same thing that there's been some internal doubts and some internal reluctance to commit to Heartsteel quite as, like, in much the same way that they were reluctant to commit to KDA back in the day, which is this internal doubt and fear that, like, there's not going to be an audience for a boy band um, among the League of Legends crowd. Like, it's, it, 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 God knows what kind of office politics go on at Riot, but that's sort of the the murmurs and rumors I've heard through the grapevine is that, yeah, they had a similar sort of, sort of uh, fighting over whether or not this was even a good idea sort of thing going on internally, which is something that I feel is reflected in, like, the splash art um, that they put out, like, this big shared group splash art that was just just in the nature of the thing that it had to be where they had to have all the characters sort of copy-pasted between different po different positions on the thing, ended up being quite poorly composed um, and just not being a very good or interesting or exciting splash art for these characters and certainly didn't show them off nearly as well um, as the music video does, which is what we're going to talk about here. I've got a three-minute video over on my Shorts channel just sort of going through why the splash art is, is really genuinely kind of terrible. And it might be worth watching that first before you watch this just as a point of comparison because what this music video does so goddamn motherfucking well is everything that the splash art is really bad at, which is that it shows off the relationships between these characters. It shows off their personalities, the ways that they interact. These, like dumbass idiot himbos trying to mount a comeback uh, from below, like, sort of, like, do-it-yourself thing. Like, that's one way in which the splash art was sort of trying to replicate what KDA did, right? Which, which having, like, this shared splash art with all the characters sort of in different positions. Like, it was sort of structurally doing the same thing. 
the music video was very, very different because where the KDA music video and all of the music, uh, well, not all of the music videos, but like both of the major music videos are K-pop music videos, right? They, these are music videos that are all about like displaying the the like the the gorgeousness and and the beauty and the like the dancing skills and like sort of displaying the glamour of these characters. This is a very different vibe. This music video is not about glamour. This music video is about like five different flavors of idiot himbo just going about doing the dumbest shit they possibly can while trying to get attention, right? Um, this is this is like five morons, uh, affectionate, just going out, making a big splashy music video by breaking into a film studio, screwing around, breaking everything, being idiots, getting arrested by the cops, but then in doing so, also showing off, like, that rock star attitude, right? Like, that smash the hotel room up, don't care about anything, chase your bliss, hedonism and fun, um, where hanging out with your boys and having a good time is more important than anything else. That kind of rock star attitude. Um, it is, in terms of the problems that I feel like this music video has, is that it has six characters, and it just, it, it tries its very, very best um, to give equal spotlight to all of them, and it can't. Uh, just by the nature of the thing, it ca it cannot give equal spotlight to all of them, and it has to rush a lot to get moments in there for all of the characters. And one of the things that sort of gets a little bit lost in that is, I think, the fluidity of the storytelling, the clarity of the storytelling. I had to watch this thing multiple times just to sort of really get a handle on what was happening. Um... And, and like what the storytelling was. And I had to go through it frame by frame multiple times watching it over to find all the good stuff about it because it is moving at such a rapid, abrupt pace that like nothing really gets to have time to land or sit with you or like like really stick with you uh, before the music video is already moving on to the next thing because it has such limited time to do all of the stuff that it wants to do. And that's like a structural thing. It's a, it's a three minute music video. Like it, you can only do so much um, over the course of such a song, especially when you have so many characters to deal with. And at the same time, rather than like, this is again, a contrast with the KDA music video where the KDA music video is just, here are these beautiful ladies doing dance moves and stuff um, in, in some cool scenes. This thing is also trying to deliver like a, a meta narrative about these characters that the concept of Heartsteel is that these guys are all like, people who are trying to mount a comeback of some sort. Like, uh, they, they, this is, like, a, more of a scrappy group from the underground trying to do it the, yourself, like, break into a music industry that has otherwise rejected them. Kane and Rost, um, like, is... Well, Kane is the most interesting of the characters, probably, because Kane is, like, he's this, like, uh, music bad boy, hella arrogant, very convinced of his own greatness, incredible spotlight hog, unwilling to share, like, credit or attention with anyone, and has, like... He's like a usual, like a, a, a music dickhead, right? Like that kind of guy. Um, where Rast especially represents like that darker side of him that is a complete spotlight hog who's like utterly self-obsessed and, and like like unwilling to be to be generous with others. That's his dark side. And then he has like this brighter side, the pop star side, the, like the side that is capable of, of, of working together with other people. And he has found like in Heartsteel a group of people who sort of share his level of ambition and talent. And he feels like, oh, okay, like, like he's sort of able to to hold his ego in check to sort of play with them. That makes Kane interesting. So like Ezreal, similar, he's like a one-hit wonder who was pushed into making some really cringe music by his label that were like micromanaging him and not allowing him to establish his own voice. And like Yone is this legendary producer who has not been interested in any project because the music industry is way too fake until Heartsteel comes along. And he's like, oh yeah, these boys, these boys have like life and energy and whatever. Like, so they all have these things of like, these are characters who are in some way trying to use Heartsteel, um, both as like an extended sort of family fr friend group sort of thing and to overcome something. And that's a very, very different set of stories than what KDA was trying to tell, which I think is interesting. I've rambled on long enough about the concept behind this thing. Let's actually talk about the animation. We open on the suiting up sequence before the heist, right? Because the boys are essentially doing a heist on a movie studio where they're going to break in and steal all the props and use them to, to record their comeback music video. That's what's going on. So this is before the heist when all the people are suiting up and getting their equipment and getting ready to do the thing. It goes by so quickly, which again is the, the 
constant problem with this music video that you kind of barely have time to register that that's what's going on. Um, but there are some good little character moments in it. Like, for example, the very first shot of, of the music video, which is Kane, where we're getting a suiting up sequence, right? Like, usually in that, there's like people strapping stuff on and putting things on, getting ready. Like, what does Kane do when he's suiting up to get ready for a heist? He unsips. <laughs> he unsips his goddamn little crop top coat uh, rather than zipping it up. Because he's got to let the girlies breathe. He's, he's got to let the abs out. He's got to look his best, bro. Um, which I thought was, like, that's actually a really good little character moment for Kane. That that's the kind of bitch he is. Um, that, like, his idea of suiting up for, like, a, for, like, a dangerous mission is to <laughs> make sure that everyone can see his fucking abs. We got a shot of Aphelios next. And I quite like a little thing in this shot, which is his phone. Hanging, hanging from his uh, little wrist thing there. Because the phone, as far as I interpret it, is essentially his communication line to Aluna. Like, that's that's how he gets a hold of his sister, um, how he texts her, how she calls him, whatever. And his lock screen is a little moon on it, which I think is cute. Like, that's a, that's an adorable little thing um, that Aphelios has, has got going on. So, again, a nice little, little bit of characterization there that, like, Aphelios has this phone that he just keeps on him at all times because he needs to be able to get a hold of his sister at all times. Cassante just basically slotting as though he's like like assembling a shotgun or something. He's just slotting a thing into a camcorder. I don't know what that is. If it's like a control thing or if it has some kind of other purpose, who knows? But one thing, look at the scribbles all over it. Um this is a, a visual element that's going to come back a lot in this music video, which is that the boys like to scribble on everything. Oh boy, do they love to, like, just gel pens and, like, markers to scribble all over absolutely everything they can get their hands on. That's a constant visual element. Another constant visual element is the texture work that's going on in this music video, which is interesting because it... It's a little bit all over the place in some ways. Like, in some ways, you have these characters who, in their character models, at their worst can sometimes be kind of Fortnite-y, right? Like, they can sometimes be kind of... The character models themselves, the faces, um, the expressions, the way they're put together, can, at their worst moments, be kind of Fortnite-y. Um, by which I mean, they look very plastic. Like, they look very much like sort of Figma action model kind of thing, um, where they don't really have the hot breath of life in them in the same way that, for example, an Arcane character does. But sticking with the arcane comparison, there's also a lot of interesting texture work going on here where we have these hand-painted textures all over much of their characters, usually except their faces. Um, which is like, that's not exclusively a thing arcane did, like Into the Spider-Verse uh, very much experimented with, with a lot of the same things. DreamWorks has played with the same things. A lot of indie animation played with it um, long before Studio Fortiche made arcane and long before Into the Spider-Verse. Like, that's a, a movement that has sort of been happening in 3D animation is this attempt to return to some of the scruffiness and roughness of of like physical media um where three dimension for a very long time especially under the auspices of like disney pixar was very clean like just making cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and more and more high fidelity there has been this movement to back towards the sort of more analog roughness which in part comes through in the idea of hand painting textures onto 3D model. And what interests me about the hand painted textures on these 3D models is the extent to which they are custom for the shot that the character is in. Because, take a look at Yone here, for example. He has these little painted highlights um, on the front of of his, like, jacket or whatever, right? These little sort of hand painted sort of uh, gouache, like, sort of oil painty ha uh, highlights that match the general light that's coming in and hitting his shoulder from the environment, right? He's not going to need those highlights in every shot that he's in. Not every shot that he's in is going to have lighting that requires those highlights to be present. And so the thing I wonder is whether or not they created custom textures for each shot that the character is in to match the color, temperature, and tone of what the character is doing and like highlights that sort of show up or whether they had some sort of procedural generation thing where certain textures will show up less and more depending on what light is hitting the character i don't know like this is this is a this is a part of of a 3d animation production that i'm not really familiar with but i'm very interested to know the extent to which the characters were retextured for a given shot um because we do know that like returning to arcane in arcane 
they hand painted light <laughs> on a lot of the things that happened in Arcane. Like that was frame by frame and hand painting light onto environments and uh, and, and onto characters in certain situations, um, which was very labor intensive. Which is part of the reason why Arcane takes so long. Um, but also really fucking cool. And I wonder to what extent they did that here, because like take a look at the contrast between like the very smudgy, very oil painty sort of texture on. Yone's coat here relative to like the hard plastic hair that he's got, like which is really just looks like kind of an action figure, right? Um, compared to the sort of smudgy naturalistic, well, not naturalistic, but the smudgy painterly textures that we've got going on in so many other parts of the environment. And it's a, it's an element that for me sometimes feels a little incongruous, like especially hair. Um, we can actually see this in a shot that's coming up here with Set, where we have like his fur collar thing that he's got, right? Which is rendered with these gorgeously hand-painted hair textures that really sort of give it like a sense of, of, of like being fluffy, of being hairy, of having like individual strands of hair that are sort of cohered together, but aren't really, like not really solidified in the same way that Yone's hairstyle is here. And occasionally I found myself sort of going, oh, that's a little incongruous. Like I would have thought that maybe the hair would be textured in sort of the same way to have like these 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 errant strands in a way that like that isn't so plastic and it's like yeah uh, there are times there are times when it felt a little incongruous to me but that's it's also a preference thing it's not really this is not really a criticism i'm making um of the thing more of reflections on exactly how it presents its aesthetic anyway tiny little thing so as yone is slamming shut the pelican case here boom the key down there does a little jump because it's sort of reacting to the force of the slam jump key little interesting thing the key started jumping here before the case actually slams shut the key is already sort of jumping into the air and then it completes the jump after the case has been shut now sort of depending on the level of pedant you are you might say ah that's an animation mistake the key should not be jumping until the force of the slam has been transferred into the table but on the other hand did anyone i didn't but did anyone on earth notice that when they was playing back at this speed, I don't think so. The only function that the key has in the shot here is just to provide a little bit of, like, um, secondary reaction to the force of the slam as Yone smacks this thing shut. Um, so that's not what I would call an animation mistake, but it's one of those little things that's fun for me to sort of go go around and look at, like the the little, the little details off on the edges. We'll talk about a golf cart later that I'm quite fascinated by. But, again... They like to scribble on their stuff. They like stickers. They like drawings and doodles and paintings on their things. And that certainly happens here on Yone as well, where we have uh, Yone's thing, one drone, um, to indicate that that's what's inside of the thing. Set, of course, his most important thing that he needs to suit up with is the hat that his mom made for him uh, because it's the most precious thing that he owns, which again, nice little character moment, um, which is also like, I think there's also a character moment here, which is that Yone has all these drones that he's bringing with him and how is he transporting them very sensibly inside like a huge pelican box with like insulated foam. It's very carefully put together. Like he, like he's got this thing tied up properly. He's not just carrying them in his arms and running along, right? Uh, this is like, this is stored and contained properly. And it's like, oh, we're, we're doing this thing right because he's he's the team mom. He's organized, right? Or team dad. I don't know exactly what the social, how the social dynamic works up. We've got Ezreal writing the words para, per, word paranoia on a tiny little camcorder tape, I think it's supposed to be because he's going to slam it into whatever the hell this thing is, which I believe, like, I think that's a viewfinder. I think it's supposed to be a camcorder. Um, and so he slams the tape in there because he's getting ready to, like, the, he's preparing the tapes for shooting the Paranoia music video. The thing, I, the thing I love about this shot and the thing that gives it a little bit of personality is that the camcorder, this is so stupid, it has, <laughs> it has a fucking kn knuckle duster. Like, it has, it has like, a, 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 what are they called? punching iron, knuckle iron thing. Like, the thing you put in your hand when you want to punch someone real good. Glued on to the side as a grip, which is like, what the fuck is this? You fucking nerd. Um, but scribbles, scribbles, hand-painted scribbles are all over the aesthetic of this thing, including in the visual effects of the thing. And the impression I think it's supposed to give is that this is the boys are making their own music video, right? So this is scuffed shit. Right? Like, this is, we don't have CGI. We don't, we, like, we can't afford CGI. We can't, like, that's not something we have we have access to. So what we're going to do is we're going to sit down with markers and gel pens, and we're just going to scribble the effects that we want 
all over um, the shots as we go, which is part of why, if you pay attention to like these sm these scratches that they've made over here, that they don't move from shot to shot because it literally just is that they've sat down and like scribbled over the animation bit by bit. Um, with we like it was scribbled over the footage bit by bit with whatever they had to hand, like sort of overlaying it on as like a transparency thing. Um, which is like okay, like that's that's the that's the vibe we're going for here. We're going for something that's like vaguely punk, which is like this is a little bit of a mismatch between the music and the actual vibes of the thing. The vibes of the thing wants to be like scrappy, small, like independent, like we're going outside of the studio system quite literally, like breaking into the establishment and stealing their resources in order to make our own thing, like without the permission of the big studio. Like that's sort of the vibe that we're going for here. The music does not sound like that. Um, again, admittedly, it's not really my genre. I don't know if there is a specific musical aesthetic for like outsider indie boy band k-pop thing whatever whatever genre this thing fits into but like when i think of like outsider music and i think of like like um independent production sort of challenging the studio system and, and whatever i don't i don't really think of a song that sounds the way that paranoia by heart steel sounds that's so like i don't know that that that, that those things fit together quite cleanly but you know whatever uh character animation so it's kane i think because we've got Yone, Aphelios, Set, uh, Cassante, and Ezreal here. So it must be Kane holding the camera here for the very first shot as they're running towards the gates of the studio uh, that they're about to break into. And then we transition into this shot, which is a security camera shot. Or is it? I'm, I'm a little confused because it is a security camera shot. It's a camera over the main gate. Like that's the that's the label that tells us. Then it's got 10 FPS, which is very common for security cameras. They are running like for hundreds of hours. You record at very low frame rates and relatively low resolutions because you don't want to fill five billion hard drives up with 10K with like 4K footage in full color and 120 FPS. So that all makes sense. But then why is the camera moving like that? That implies that this is a drone camera, right? Is that a thing? Like, are there security drone cameras that just, like, hover in the air recording at 10 FPS? Is that something people do? Security cameras are usually mounted, right? So that, is, again, doesn't matter. It's not important. Like, like the reason why this shot looks the way that it does like this is probably just because that's more dynamic. Like, rather than having a static shot from a camera that's, that's just sitting there, not moving, not doing anything, they wanted a little tracking shot to sort of follow the boys and sort of provide a little bit of forward momentum kind of thing. That's probably the thing they wanted just, like, for the vibe of it. I just found it a little bit weird that this is supposed to be, a, like, a security gate camera that... That seems to float and rotate a little bit odd. Something I do appreciate, though, is that the camera up here says it's running at 10 FPS and looking at what the footage looks like, how choppy it is. Yeah, I think actually I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know 100% no, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if that's actually something they did. Like they did actually specify that this is footage that's running back at 10 frames per second. Um, which is a little attention to detail that I love. I, 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 I found that quite charming that they did lower the frame rate of the security camera believably um, to sort of match the shot. Anyway, dog time. I love this dog. I love the texturing on this dog a lot. It's gorgeously painted um, as a character, but it's ruined a little bit by YouTube. Um, I have to get this footage off of YouTube. I can't get uncompressed 4K versions of these things, much though I would like to. Um... <clears throat> So this is 2K footage from YouTube, which means we get horrible color banding. Like, just absolutely horrendous color banding. Completely ruining, like, any subtlety in the painting work on the darker parts of this dog's texture. Because YouTube crushes especially dark colors down to just these flat blocks. blocks, And it looks terrible. I hate it very much. I hate it almost as much as I hate the fucking motion blur uh, that's used all over this music video. But we'll get to that once we get there. But I do love the dog where we get the classic thing where, like, the ears raise up first. Like, sort of rotate around looking for the source of whatever disturbance. And then the dog lifts up. And look at the way, like, especially the face. Look at the way the face on this thing lifts up from the ground. It is gorgeous. Because... Right? You can see the jowls, like, sort of splayed out, sort of like a... Like a... Being dragged up from the ground like that, which I really... Just, just charming that the dog is like... The, this is the thing, like, a lot of the character models on, on the boys are plastic sometimes. They feel a little plastic, they feel kind of stiff sometimes. But then there's parts like this dog here, which is animated with such a lovely fluidity. 
in its physicality that really supports like the idea of like this thing being like a, a, a big jowly guard dog uh, that that I quite love. Anyway, we cut to Kane on top of um, a warehouse or whatever um, as one of Yone's drone cameras is swooping on him. He takes a pair of sunglasses off and throws them away because he's that kind of boy. And then we get to hear his voice for the first time. And I don't want to play much of the music video for you, but I do want to play just the bit where we get to hear Kane's voice in this music video because it's like two sides to a story, but they never tell my side. Never been the kind of got to stay inside the guidelines. I, I laughed at that when I saw the music video for the first time because like, ah, uh, I know that you can't pick like I know that the singers and like and like the performers, you don't necessarily voice match them to the characters as such. But there is not voice matching the character and then there's not voice matching the character at all. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, you gave him that really sort of, like, deep, growly, edgy thing. Like, no, that's not Kane. Kane doesn't sound like that. Again, this doesn't really matter that. I think it matters on a character design perspective. Like, Kane as a character design doesn't look like someone who sounds like that to me. Like, that's not the vibe I get from, like, even not knowing his original voice performance and his original voice actor. That's not what that sound. That's not what this character would sound like in my head if I were to invent a voice from them from scratch. It also kind of doesn't matter that much. Like, it's not, again, it's a thing that, like, I ping off of it because I know Kane's voice. I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. Maybe it's not really, like, I don't think it's something that a general audience would be that concerned with. And I don't think it matters that much because, like, it's a music video. It's a performance. Like, the characters are performing things. And if Kane's singing voice or performance voice sounds like that in-universe, then, like, I am perfectly happy just to say kind of whatever. So, big swoop in on the camera. And here, again... I love I, I am so curious about the texture work. Because like when we got the shot from here, right? We get this yellow texture. Like this yellow lighting texture that's that sort of hangs on the side, which I don't think is hand painted. And but closing in further, like maybe it is. And that fades out as the camera swoops around. Like that, that yellowness completely disappears from the side of his jacket and is replaced with this like bright blue light coming down from the sky and the rest of the environment, which is then also painted onto his jacket, which is like, do they just apply color filters? to texturing that's already done on the model and then highlight certain smears with that? I, I don't know. I don't 100% know. I'm fascinated by it, though. Um, and we get a little bit of character acting from Kane here where he throws up the hand signs, and I love the facial animation on a lot of these characters. Um, I, th I think it's really quite good, and Kane is no exception. Like, you see that little, like, that little twist of the lip as he, like, pushes out for the woo? There, like, the way that the lip rises up from his gums and you can kind of see a little bit more into the mouth. Right? Like, that's such a shit eat. Like, that's such an arrogant way to to speak, isn't it? Like, that doesn't look like someone who's saying, Ah, yes, hello, greetings, welcome along, this is a business meeting. That's not like someone saying, I am so much better than you. That's what that looks like, right? Like, that's as, as facial acting, that's what it looks like he's saying. Is, like, a proclamation of supremacy. Um, and one thing I do like is that the facial acting, the facial animation of these characters is not afraid to deform their 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 features. This is not Kane looking his best here, right? Like this is Kane looking. Let's <laughs> go a little bit. Uh, hello, my name is Kane. Me. <laughs> And I do like that, like, the facial acting that these characters have got going on doesn't prioritize making them pretty in every single shot that they're in, right? That's not a thing that the facial acting on these characters prioritizes. They are pretty in a lot of the shots that they're in, but it's not like they don't limit the range of expression in the animation in order to keep them pretty. And I, I do like that a lot because that's not a given with a lot of modern animation. Like, anime animation, for example, is, is vehemently opposed to this. So, here, as Kane is about to throw this uh, salute and, like, go backwards, I think we get our first instance of a little bit of coyote time. Just, like, not a lot, just a little bit of coyote time. Well, mm, this, I don't know if that's exactly the right way to put it, but coyote time in animation is essentially the principle that, you know, in Roadrunner cartoons, when the coyote runs out over the edge of a cliff and he's chasing the Roadrunner, he's like, aha, I'm gonna get you, Roadrunner, and then eventually he sort of realizes, oh, wait, I'm not standing on anything and then gravity kicks in once it would be funny for the gravity to kick in. That's not like an animation principle that exists all over animation where sometimes you just suspend gravity a little. Like you play, like even if a, if if the 
general principles of animation would dictate that something that's flying through the air should move at a fairly constant rate unless acted upon by, by, by an outside force. We just manipulate like just how quickly gravity affects something, how quickly gravity pulls on something. Just like just to, to make a point in a shot or in order to like manipulate the timing of, of, of a motion such that it lands cinematically um, in a way that you just can't do in live action, right? Um, and I think we get that here where like we get a little bit of like when Kane is leaning backwards here, this section to me in particular reads like they're just slowing down a little bit because like once he loses his center of gravity, like once he loses his balance, he should only accelerate, right? Like gravity should only pull on him faster and faster, but this is very, very slow falling, which allows him to complete like his little thing of like reaching up, doing the gesture, doing his little sneer. I love his little sneer. Kane does love to sneer um, by like pulling up the lip on one side, flashing the teeth, getting this like crooked grin thing going on. Um, very much a him thing that I quite like. It allows him to do this little head wiggle thing that he's doing here where he's like, you can see how he's leaning out to one side and then woof, giving us the the swing of the salute and then we come in, come into the fall. And some interesting uh, some interesting playing around going on here. You see all the speed lines in the shot. Some of them are I think effects applied in camera, but a lot of the speed lines here if you pay attention they are actually textures painted onto the sides of the shaft that we're falling down. Like, they're literally just textures that have been painted onto the 3D environment, as far as I can tell. Um, and so as the camera is moving quickly through, you get this sense of speed that comes from having these speed line textures there. But they're not... Um, like, traditionally, once you, when you do those kinds of textures, especially in anime, for example, that's stuff that you overlay over the top of the screen in some way or another. Like, that's speed lines that sort of that sort of fly by independent of the environment. Painting them onto the sides of the environment like this, I think, is quite cool. It, all, it helps the perspective. Um, it helps the sense of speed. It creates less distracting pa particles in the middle of the shot. Uh, I quite like this as a way to do things. Um, because, like, what the purpose of those speed lines is to essentially... If, emulate the effects of motion blur, um, like the effects of when you're moving very fast past something, that its details get smeared out concurrent to the direction that, that you're going. Painting them onto the environment allows for, like, I think a much greater clarity of visuals while still providing that sense of speed um, that those things are going to do. Another little bit of playing around with, um, with, like, gravity. The camera is descending down the shaft at a constant rate, right? Like, the camera's movement speed, which presumably, again, one of Yone's drones, one imagines in the lore, <clears throat> is constant. It doesn't really change speed at all as it's going down the shaft, right? Kane does, though. Um, and it's justified in the shot that, like, he's coming down, the rope is snapping, sh uh, snapping taut, and he's, like, hanging out, doing a little piece to camera with, once again, his little silly smirk on his face while the camera is moving down at the same rate as him. And then eventually he sort of goes, I'm going to snap out of this now. And then instantly he just accelerates so much faster than the camera. Um, where, again, we're playing with the exact... Like, we're not trying to emulate realistic physics here. We're trying to emulate believable physics. Physics that you can sort of, like, go, okay, that's, that's, that's probably how that works. And speed textures. This is something I love. Like, hand-painted speed textures on the character. Um, you can see that on the little streamer thing that he's got here as he's coming down, how they have hand-painted speed lines over the thing concurrent with its with its motion <coughs> and its movement as Kane is coming down the shaft to sort of like aid the, the visual sensation that this thing is like whipping back and forth in the wind really, really rapidly. Even though if you actually pay attention to how much it's actually moving in shot, it's not really whipping around that wildly, but adding those little speed lines to it, once you see that, like, in, in full motion, adds a lot of sense of, like, chaotic, wind-whipping-by wildness to the thing um, as it's coming through in the camera. It's just, like, yeah, little things that I love. Again, stuff that's taken directly from the principles of 2D animation applied to 3D. You can see it happening here as well as Kane, like, flips, flips around. Lots of 2D painted textures... Um, to sort of like to stretch him out a little bit. You can see it on his fingers and his hands, right? Like the way that they're being distorted, um, especially the hand over there, actually. Oh, saw such fingers. That hand, <laughs> how it's being stretched out to sort of to sort of aid the appearance of the speed with with the character with which the character is moving. That's we can see that again here. 
you can see the way that Kane like stretches a little bit as he's landing. We get many more of those speed lines that really sort of smear him out. And this is where like you have all of this already. You have all of these lovely scribbles, which I don't know if the implication is. If the implication is that when Ezreal slams the thing into the camera, that's because the boys are going over and like scribbling with crayons over top of the film to sort of create the visual effects that they want. Is the implication that that's also what's happening when there are speed lines in like blurry footage? Is that they, they saw the blurry footage and they were like, okay, we're gonna scribble a bunch of speed lines over it. I don't know, but I hate the motion blur. I, I, I really hate the motion blur that they're using here because Look how fucking blurry all of this looks. I can't see what's going on. I can't I can't see the animation. I can't see the action. Motion blur and like camera blur. This is like I think this is like a, a emulation of camera blur. That's all about emulating the properties of a physical camera. That's optional. You don't have to do that in 3D. You don't even have to emulate depth of field in 3D um, if you don't want to. And yet a lot of 3D animation insists on doing it because it makes the thing look more cinematic. It makes it look more movie-like. It makes it look more like stuff that's filmed with a camera. And I, mm, I, I have such a bugbear about it because I like clarity. I don't like, I, oh, that's a flaw in the camera. Why are you replicating a flaw in the camera that makes it harder to see shit when you could make it clear? You could make it easier to see shit for freaks and weirdos like me who frame by frame their way through the, why is this shot so blurry? I want to see what it looks like when Kane lands. I want to see his anatomy distort. I want to see the things that the, like, what's the animator fucking doing here? What's happening to Kane's arm? Is it completely being broken in like a really cool, interesting, like breaking the model, squash and stretch kind of way? Or is it just normal? I don't think it's normal. I don't think an arm is supposed to do that normally, but I can't see it because it's blurry. So that annoys me a little bit. Um, lovely motion on Kane as he's standing up from like the landing here. More scribbles all over the thing, which is like, these are the Rast effects. Specifically, these are very much Kane's personal visual effects. And I really like like the translation of like, he has all this downwards momentum. He lands, boom, compresses like a spring in order to absorb it. Again, if only this was not blurry, I could see what the fuck was going on. He compresses like a spring in order to absorb it. And then as he comes up, he translates like that, that energy that is like, boom, that's then bouncing back up into like sort of pushing him up, including like the streamer, like that's flying up into the air is like from the reverse of that energy that went into the floor and got bounced back and then allows that to carry him into that this little saunter that he's doing, right? There's little like, boom, dun, 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 like sauntering forwards, confident, cocky, being the cane that he is as the guard dog, our good friend, comes charging in from behind. And this is where a little bit of the fiction breaks, right? Like the fiction is that the boys with handheld camcorders are breaking into this movie studio in order to film their music video and just like, yeah, they're just, they're just getting whatever shots they can and like, scrabbling it together into something that they can release, right? If that were true, how would whoever is controlling the camera right now, which would be either Yone or Kane, how would they know to frame the hallway behind Kane here such that we get a really good shot of the dog coming around the corner um, that they can manipulate and play with and scribble all over. How would they know that unless they also, like, unless they were manipulating the dog to go to exactly that position at that moment? How would they know to set up that shot, right? So that breaks the fiction a little bit. Again, this doesn't really matter that much, but it is a thing that I, like, that I noticed and I kind of went, eh, it's like, mm. it would have been, it would have been funnier to me if, like, if Kane had been trying to just take selfie shots, like he was just trying to take glamour shots of himself, um, because he's a cocky little shit, and then the dog shows up and kind of ruins it, um, rather than this sort of, I already knew that that dog was going to be there, and I have the shot perfectly framed up, and I am not even worried as it's charging towards me, because I am going to phase through the wall, and the dog will be unable to catch. Like, that sort of thing, is like, I feel like it would have been nicer and funnier if the dog kind of ruined Kane trying to posture and look cool. Um, but that, little things, doesn't matter. What's cool about the shot, though, all the scribbles and the effects that are painted on top of it, these hand-painted light effects with just like a visual al alpha glow around it, like this little skid cloud, hand-painted. And then they do this shit, which is like, so what's happening here is solarization. Is That's what that visual effect is called. Solarization with a bunch of coloring on uh, going on on top of it. Which is like, this is very grunge. Like this is like this whole thing they've got going on here. That's very much a grunge aesthetic. That's very much an aesthetic from like that you would find in punk movements. It's the aesthetic of uh, that, uh, that Ralph Bakshi used for his 
animated adaptation of Lord of the Rings, like all of the live action footage that he shot, they solarized in order to create these like really heavy, dark um, light and shadow things going on um, that's being used here as sort of a filter thrown over the whole thing. And then a bunch of interesting scribbles going on with the implication of these shots. There's going to be a bunch of these shots throughout the music video is that, again, this is like the boys taking still frames from the footage that they've shot and then going through and doing all kinds of physical processing to them um, to make them look cool and then reinserting those shots back into the thing. So someone has like grabbed some masking tape and like masked out the dog and then drawn the dog over the top of the masking tape that they're sort of pasting onto um, onto like this thing that they're inserting as frames in the shot, um, which I think is cool. I think that's fun as a visual aesthetic. If only it wasn't a thing of where I kept looking, but how did he know to get that shot? How did he know that he was supposed to frame that up so that so that the dog would be in the picture? How did he know that? He's not supposed to know that. Anyway, doesn't matter. Once again, Kane. Oh, my boy loves sneering. He loves the crooked grin. He loves having his mouth not be straight in any way. Uh, just like curling and curving up around. Oh boy, does he love it. And it suits him. It suits him very well. And there's an interesting mix here because like these smoke effects, right? This is like high fidelity, 3D smoke effects that like the 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 sort of thing you'd see in like the in like professional grade animation like these very physics rendered smoke cloud effects and then over the top and under all of that which is the other interesting thing you get these hand scribble paint lines which again is the fiction here that the boys are going through their footage hand painting all their own effects into it or is the fiction here that that's just what it looks like when they're doing stuff in real life and reality I wish there was a little bit more clarity about that in the thing, because the smoke is like, obviously, that they didn't hand paint that frame by frame in the picture. That smoke seems to actually fucking be there in real life, which means that Kane has actual physical magic powers in real life and can just do that. In which case, okay, so when he does that smoke thing going through the wall, does that mean he's also doing all of that in real life? And if he is, what does that look like from the side? When, like... How does that know to poke to... Like, it raises these nerd questions in my mind where I'm like, what's the diegesis here? Like, how am, how am I supposed to understand the action that's happening here? Is this a bunch of scrappy independent nobodies like with, with drone cameras and handheld footage trying to make a music video on a nothing budget? Or is this like pop stars with a professional mega budget for hugely expensive visual effects and like the, and like special effects and complete knowledge of everything that's going to happen in the shoot that they're going on? I wish there was a little bit stronger clarity between them because it seems to shift what exactly the concept of the music video is depending on whatever the hell they happen to want to do in each given shot. They just sort of shift between, oh, these are pops like music stars who are in total control of their environment and these are boys who have no idea what they're doing and just kind of flying by the seat of their pants. And yeah, I wish there was a little bit more clarity about it. Anyway, character animation, once again, Kane is allowed to distort. His face is allowed to go a little bit weird looking. Like we get this like this big flat lower lip that's sort of protruding out from his lower teeth in a way that's like not pop star pretty, um, which I really do quite, quite appreciate. It makes him look a little bit more like unhinged and freaky, um, which is something I quite like. As we get into, okay, this is where I get to really nitpick um, little things about it, which, mm, okay, so Kane is going to do his little his little, uh, his little routine, like, doing acrobatics through this laser grid, and he's not touching a single one of the laser grids because he's doing the Mission Impossible kind of thing or whatever. Except, except this idiot absolutely is. He's triggering so fucking many of these. Right here, a laser beam is clearly passing right the fuck through his body. <laughs> he's triggering that laser beam right fucking here. And also that one. Like, I don't know how that arm goes from here to there without passing through the laser beam. Uh, so he's triggering that one definitely as well. That's his leg going through a fucking laser beam right there. Twice. And then he shifts into Rost form. But like, he triggers multiple ones of those laser beams. And again, I'm not sure how to take the diegesis here. Um, like, is it a thing of, like, he's showing off and he's trying to look so cool and he's dodging all the laser beams, except he's obviously fucking triggering them because, like, he's not as cool as he thinks he is? Or is it just that the animators know that only weirdos like me, as he breaks the laser beam here, that only weirdos like me who go through this thing frame by frame, like nerds, 
will ever actually notice that Kane is breaking the laser beams. Like, I don't know if this is something that's supposed to be a cool little detail that you can find if you look through it frame by frame, or if it's just like, yeah, the like the anime. Obviously, the animators didn't bother to make sure that every single laser beam was actually unbroken. Only weirdos would look at that because this thing happens this fast when it's actually played back. No one's gonna notice it. The important thing is the storytelling that he's doing this little acrobatic routine to dodge all the laser beams. I don't know. Um, I hope it's I hope it's intentional. I hope it's on purpose. Anyway, lovely animation smears, hand painted, two D textures being projected into the camera to emphasize the motion and movement of Kane as he uh, goes face down, ass up. And look at the breaking of the model there. Like, look at how his leg goes convex, concave, one of the two, uh, coming into the motion, swinging up around as he, like, rotates around his own hip and his own momentum into that thing, getting the jump up over. Lots of trailing going on here to really emphasize the speed with which he's moving. Like, lots of really extreme strong posing and positions where his spine and everything about his body is really, really twisting into these motions. Going up and over. Lots of smearing happening. Like, like, and it looks great. Like, it looks so good in motion. Everything Kane's doing here looks so fucking good in motion. Like, the anticipation here, right? As like, he, he lands in the handstand, he's doing the thing, he's breaking the laser beams all over the place over and over again. Um, and then as he gets ready to do the little spin move around, watch his leg there. Like, he begins the rotation at the base of his hip. Then you can see how the upper body begins to follow as he sort of pushes himself into this, like, little breakdance move. We get doubling. We get lots of distortion on the character model here, like, really emphasizing the foreshortening and the perspective into the shot as, like... We get the doubling, we get the smearing, swings around, swoops into the thing. Ah, it looks so fucking good. And the squash and stretch, he squashes down. Whoop! We can see him extend like rubber as he flips on over here. And as he flips on over, there's a model swap that happens. And you can see it happening here, right? Here, this is Kane. Boom, that's Rast. He just swaps from one to the other. Um between these two frames of animation. Um, so it's not like one transforms into the other. They have two different character models and they just swap from one to another at a moment when you won't notice it, specifically a moment that coincides with a laser beam crossing over the front of the character, right? So it acts like kind of a screen wipe that sort of masks the transition from Kane into Rost. And we get a little bit, again, this is a thing that I feel like maybe doesn't, it's the kind of thing that draws a little bit of unhappy comparison to KDA, where we get the mask with the animation happening on it to indicate speech, which is exactly the same thing that Akali did, which is like, mm, why would you reuse that gimmick? Like, it, again, it's just inviting comparisons that are like, I don't know why you would want those. It's very cool. Like, I love how it looks. It's great. Like, I love this little extremely low fidelity talking animation that he's got going on on his Rast face. I love the smearing. I love the stretching in camera that's happening as Rast like swings around and starts doing his fully some Looney Tune shit. Like he he is fully on some Tex Avery bullshit here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like wow. And it's it's partly because the shot is so far away. We're looking over Cassante's shoulder at Kane moving. Because the shot is so far away, they can be even more exaggerated in the way that they move and distort his body. Um, as Rast, but I think it also reflects the idea that Rast is like more of a sort of the mask sort of character, like a, so a sort of more cartoony over the top extreme version of Kane that like really does go kind of cartoony, like it's, it's the Joker version of Kane in that sense, like that really can spaghettify and make a noodle out of him um, whenever it's convenient for the shot that they want to do, because like look at how liquid, how fluid he is as he like comes into shot here, like look hanging upside down, flashing his eyes. And as he begins to, like, zoom back towards the camera that's being operated by set, you see how his face, his head just kind of stays in place and then the body sort of goes, like it's being slurped up or something? Like, that's really fucking great. I really like that. Like, a super duper duper cartoony and over the top in a way that I just find endlessly charming. And then swap back to the cane model. Whoop. As he breaks another laser beam. <laughs> and sort of awkwardly positions himself around everything he's doing. And again, this is more subtle than it is with Rast, but you can see... Whee! 
Hey! <laughs> you can see the stretching that's happening with Kane here. And I do love that, like, Kane sort of wobbles between, like, this sort of confident, I'm very sexy, hot pop star posturing and being a goofy goober. Like, being a genuinely a very silly little lad as he's doing this, like, sort of crazy motion around his head. And then as he b decides to get out of the shot, whee! <laughs> <laughs> like, this is... That's fully a Spongebob motion. That's fully some Spongebob shit. Like, who the hell does that? Like, woo! <laughs> ah, it's so charming. It's so much fun. I really like it. And then we get a little bit of speed ramping, right? Like, again, coyote time. We talked about this. Where, yeah, we're doing the slowdown thing. We're sort of slowing down time. We're doing Matrix bullet time shit as Kane hangs in the air. But we're also doing coyote time. Because Kane reaches the apex of his jump... And then gravity just stops affecting him, right? He's moving up really quickly. Then we speed ramp. And then gravity just doesn't affect him. Like, he's just hanging there, right? Like, not, no sense of moving upwards, no sense of moving downwards. We're just l suspending him in air in preparation for the motion that he's about to do, right? And that's coyote time. That's manipulating physics in order to sort of make a point. And it's the same thing here. As he throws this thing, notice that Kane ain't moving. Like, Kane is able to full speed throw this little USB drive thing to disable the security ca uh, camera on the guard station or whatever. And he's not affected by gravity in the least while this is happening. He's just hanging there for quite a long time without moving an inch out of his position in the air. Wings this thing right through there. Boom. Over the shoulder of the guy into the thing. Boom. Hacking the mainframe. I don't know why they do this though. Because the shot that, that Kane switched, like, he throws this computer virus thing into the, all the security cameras, right? And you'd think that was to prevent them from being caught or something. Like, you'd think they would be to some kind of, uh, to, you know, to hide what they've done. But what instead the computer virus does is it swaps over to a shot that's then immediately going to show Ezreal <laughs> breaking into the vehicles department. <laughs> Um, so I don't know what he was hoping to accomplish by doing that. Uh, maybe to make sure that they get seen, because they want to get seen? Anyway, I don't know. Anyone know what that thing's a reference to? This, like, fairy thing with the afro and the... Like, is the animation studio, like, attached to another thing that this is a reference to, or is it just supposed to be a generic bobblehead? It feels like it's supposed to be a reference to something like the poster way back at the beginning, but I don't know. Okay, now we get to spend some time with our boy Ezreal and all of his cool little visual effects. And Ezreal... His visual effects are expressed, like, this, again, to me, it's that thing of diegesis, right? Like, is he actually literally able to teleport in real life? Okay, cool. If so, does it just look like that? Like, the diegesis. I wish the diegesis was a little bit clearer, because they're trying to actually tell a story about these guys, right? Like, this is not like the KDA music video that clearly takes place in music video space. The music video is trying to take place in the real world with the boys trying to project an image of themselves over that. And it's like, so can Ezreal actually teleport then? And does it look like that? Like when we get freeze frames like this, where they have painted over him clearly, is that just shit that happens in real life that Ezreal suddenly turns into a 2D projection um, to other people looking at him that can still snatch like a 3D rendered cloth object? off of a dinosaur? Is that... How am I supposed to take this? Again, I am overthinking it. It doesn't matter. It looks cool. It's a music video. Who cares? It's just... It's a storytelling thing, right? So, dear Ezreal, I like the way that his teleportation, like his blink teleportation power is rendered, like the way it interacts with his character animation, right? Because what happens is he takes a step forward, teleports, and then as he reaches the new destination, that same step that he begun here is completed. And then he takes another step, and you can see like he's about to put that right foot down, and then he teleports over there, and then he completes the same motion. Like, he, he finishes the motion after the teleport. So, like, and I like that, that it's like, there's this sense of continuity between the blinks when he hops from place to place. Uh, that, that just get, gives it like a really nice flow through the shot that I quite enjoy. Like, that's just... Yeah, I like that. Like, that we get this thing of, like, he teleports a little bit to the right and then swerves a little bit of an S-curve over to the left. Whoop. And then we get this. And here we can really see how 2D and 3D animation interact, right? Because we get this smearing on Ezreal as he gets this very, very long hand that, like, gets spaghettified out 
as he swipes across and pulls off this cloth. And we can see the cloth moving at a completely different frame rate <laughs> from Ezreal himself, right? And I don't. if you've watched these animation breakdowns before, you've heard me talking about animating on 1s, animating on 2s, animating on 3s. And generally speaking, in 3D animation and in actual real-life camera footage, everything is moving on 1s, which is to say that every single frame that the camera is running, something is moving, something is changing, something is happening, because the real world is, is happening. And on 3D animation, you generally render at the full frame rate of whatever, usually 24 frames per second. For web video, it's 30 frames per second, whatever. Um, 2D animation, though, it's a lot of work making all of those frames, so you tend to animate at lower frame rates, and that's being used here very intentionally, where Ezreal is animated at an exceptionally low frame rate, um, because he gets into this position here, and then it's one, two, three, then four, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Like, you can see he's animated, like, here there's like a four second, a uh, four frame hold, then we get like a little two frame hold, before he swipes, then like we're animated on twos for a second, and then we're animated on ones just for this last one, where something happens every single frame, right? And that's a disjointedness that you can't get in real life, um, but which is being used here to communicate a particular animation aesthetic, which is in stark contrast to the smooth, constant motion of this 3D animated cloth thing, which did they project 2D textures onto that animated cloth? I want to know, because like those are definitely 2D, but I feel like it's when he gets to the car, which he does here, right? Like when he's pulling this cloth off, he's doing the same thing again. Like he's pulling the cloth off the car with his foot. And here, like clearly those textures are like hand painted, right? So they hand painted textures onto the cloth here. But I don't think they did that in the previous shot. And I've been wondering about that. Yeah, because that's all... Surely that's all generated by the lighting engine, surely. Anyway, that, that was just an idle thing that I got distracted by and, and curious about. Where we use like the, the swoop of the cloth as he pulls it down whoop, to swoop up and reveal Ezreal teleporting up on top of a dinosaur that he has already scribbled on somehow, even though he only just pulled the cloth. Editing tricks, I guess. Um, and Cassante, in what I am... 100% fucking certain that's a reference to Little House, uh, Little Shop of Horrors. That's Audrey 2. Cassante is wearing an Audrey 2 costume coming up behind him, scaring poor Ezreal. <laughs> Which is interesting, guys, because I think there's a lot of movie references in this thing in general. Um, not all of which I have caught because I'm not that much of a movie buff. Um, but that, like, that costume that Cassante is wearing is like, that's definitely Audrey 2, isn't it? Notice how the light is used. While we're focused on Ezreal, right? Like, why he, while he's doing his little sort of pop star singy boy, swerving his head back and forth, looking like K-pop uh, John Lennon, Cassante is sort of slowly creeping up behind him, and then when Cassante makes the decision to actually scare him, notice how the light, just like, there's a little spotlight that just, like, lights up on him, whoop, and helps us notice him, right as Ezreal does. Um, and I love the posing on it. Like, again... Such a cartoon thing. Yikes, gang! <laughs> and, like, tips over so smoothly down off of the dinosaur, which I quite like. Also, Cassante's scaring animation. I like that. I like that, like, kind of stodgy motion that he's got going on. Oops! That wasn't... I, I wasn't supposed to, like, make him fall off the dinosaur. Because it's a bunch of dumb boys messing around and getting into trouble and accidents. And another little thing I like, Ezreal's teeth aren't all 100% straight. It's just a little thing, but like that he has these two front teeth that are just like a little bit bigger. Like where if you would go going to like reconstruct a surgery and shit like that to get like the perfect row of teeth. They're very white teeth, obviously, but they wouldn't quite look like that. Would they? They're a little bit... They're a little bit human. They're a little bit rugged. They're a little bit like... And again, that's the thing, compare and contrast with anime characters, like the, the, the sort of plastic perfection of them, or Fortnite characters. It's, I like that Ezreal has these slightly... slightly jagged little little row of teeth there that's like less than 100% perfect. I quite enjoy that. That's a small thing, but something I really like. A bunch more, like, see how the curve, like the, how the swoop of this, like, hand-painted... 
2D effect is used to like really emphasize like that he's like going past and then swooping over getting the car out. And we see these keys come back. Like these look like exactly the same keys as the one that Yone had on his desk or uh, next to his Pelican case at the start. They might just have reused the same key asset um, without like, like thinking that no, again, only freaks and weirdos like me who bother going through this shit frame by frame would actually notice that sort of thing. But yeah, whatever, whatever. I love this. This, right? Like as Ezreal is like spinning the key around his finger, being all confident, like, yeah, baby, want to take a ride in my whoops. We get this thing of like his hand notices that the, that the keys are gone before he does. Because we get this like the keys fly off and you can see the fingers sort of like they sort of start to grasp for the key, and then we get this little blink, this little beat, and then what? <laughs> this distressed little like, oh no! As we speed ramp with the keys over towards Kane, who's looking so cool and handsome, and as and Kane goes from literally doing a fucking DreamWorks face with like the eyebrow down and up to pouting. It's such good expressions, isn't it? Like, I really like the expressions here. They're so cute. And, and like, it is, it is the expressiveness that keeps drawing me into these characters that, that it really does feel like they have a bunch of shit going on inside them that's coming out through the way that they look, through the way that they emote. Right? Like, you can see that with Cassante as well. Like, as he sort of looks at the key, goes, hmm, I got the key. And then smirk, look back at Kane, and go, I'm driving. It's charming. It's just charming. It's just fun that these boys are, like, constantly getting over, getting in each other's way, tripping each other up as they try to look cool. I also like the motion of the cars. It's like, they commit quite a lot of property damage here. <laughs> it's just like, hmm, that's a little... You were, you were just breaking into film a music video before, but now we have progressed to full-blown, like, rather severe vandalism. Lots of flash frames going on here. Lovely flash frames too, where you get like this super solarized, like blown out, like they took the film out of an actual film camera and just exposed it to sunlight kind of thing. With the scribbles like, hey, question mark. Then boom, they have literally like Photoshop cut out of the thing. And like this, this Photoshop background. And then like <laughs> crudely drawn a, a bumpy square child car into the frame. Then we get this one, which is like even more processed to the point when it's barely legible. And then we sort of transition out of all of this distortion with more scribbles by the boys over the top of the frames into what looks like a real camera shot, right? With again, all this fucking motion blur. And then like set, of course, with a fucking flare just blasting down the road. Aphelios doing a little bit of the camera work, and Yone just standing up there operating his camera drones, literally at this point, like, taking the shot of himself because it will be one of his camera drones that are, like, doing this. Turn it around to look at the ice cream van that that Kane is having a... <laughs> that Kane is having an excellent time driving, but obviously he's quite terrible at it because Ezreal is not having a good time at all. <laughs> you see Ezra like just okay, oh god no help ah, I don't have a seatbelt he's trying to kill me and then like Kane just like shoving out of the way nerd I'm driving <laughs> it's like again it's lovely it's the personality clash between them where Ezreal is this little one hit wonder pop pretty boy and Kane is like a this this malicious, evil, sadistic bad boy of pop. And you can just see that dynamic between the two of them here. Like fully in play that this little kiddo just does not have any way to handle all of the chaos and madness that Kane is bringing to the scene. It's charming. It's fun. I really enjoy it. So another couple of interesting little little doodle frames where we get this shot where it's been printed out, I guess, on canvas. It looks like it looks like it's been it's they printed out the photo on canvas 
and then just started painting over it with markers and like this little scribble like hi my name is Cassante and like these little scribbles over his hair and over the outlines like just the barest outlines of who he is and what he's doing tape all over the frame as though this is just like something they've sort of taped down and like taken a picture up with a phone camera same thing with this second frame where you can see like how the colors shift between the two of them like they ran out of this particular marker and also they're clearly taking pictures of this canvas printout thing that they're doing at different times of day Right, like this is sort of in fairly neutral, bright white light. And then this is like, oh, they're taking this picture of the thing at sunset where there are shadows in the room that are falling over this printed out picture um, that they're taking of the thing to insert into the film. So you get this sense like, okay, they painted this one and then it took them like a couple of hours to do the next one. And then it took them a couple of hours to do the next one. So the light keeps shifting in the room where they're taking these pictures for the thing that's going to be inserted into the, sh into the shot of the thing. Which I just, I find that really quite charming. And you see that Cassante is literally signing his autograph on each of them. <laughs> and you can even see the frame counts, right? Like, you can even see that, like, 10, 000, like 1009, 1011, 1013, 1015. Because. One. Two. One. Two. One. Two. They're animated on twos. So the frame counts that they have scribbled with pen down there in the corner of this thing are accurate that this is frame 1000. I, I haven't gone through and like counted to make sure a lot of stuff could have been lost in editing. I haven't gone through and counted to make sure that this is actually frame 1009 of um, of the actual music video. It very may, well may not be, but it is accurate that the, the gap between this frame and that frame is two frames. Literally, it stays on screen for two frames. And I just love that little detail. I love that little detail that they get that little accurate frame counting. That's so fun. Anyway, here's the golf cart I've been obsessed with. Do you see that golf cart? Do you see the way that light is rendered pretty much everywhere else in the music video, right? Like all the scribbling, all the hand painting, all like this, this like real motion blur and fake motion blur inserted over the shot. And then as Cassante comes around the corner here, we get Sims 2 golf cart that doesn't actually have a proper shadow <laughs> that like sort of barely seems tech looks like very much like just that like an asset from an asset store that they just placed into the thing without really applying any of the texturing or lighting that they have in anywhere else in the music video to the object as it sort of swoops into shot same thing goes for like this little sandwich board thing that they've got, got going on over here like very very sort of basic 3d model things that I wouldn't be surprised that the, if these were just like stock assets that were picked up on like a marketplace somewhere and like used as set dressing for the music video. And I just noticed those like when I was going through the thing frame by frame, I was like that that golf cart doesn't look like it belongs there at all. <laughs> it doesn't look present in this moment at all. The lighting effects on that golf cart don't look right at all for the environment, like the stark nighttime lighting that it's in. That's very funny to me. Um, again, not a criticism of the music video. It doesn't matter. You don't see it. When you're going through this shit full speed, no one's going to notice it except weirdos like me. Uh, but I just love noticing it. I quite enjoyed it. Again, a little bit of speed ramping, um, sort of messing with the speed with which things move. As the car of Cassante, like as Cassante's car s sort of skits out, it's the first one to leave the frame. So here, it suddenly gets like a huge sp speed boost. Zoom, just gone. The ice cream truck lands, zoom, just gone. And then, like, the convertible sort of, or the Cadillac thing gets, like, the slow thing where, like, it goes over the drone and, like, the camera sort of whips up to follow it. I love the animation on the cars as well. It's less my thing. Like, technical animation like that is, like, less my thing. But pay attention to the ice cream truck. In fact, let me zoom in on it a little bit. As it ramps up into the air, as it's about to come down, do you see that? Do you see how the wheels almost detach from the bottom, like on the suspension, and sort of almost reach down towards the ground to sort of anticipate the landing as the rest of the machine comes down to follow? That is 2D animation that you do on human characters, right? Like that's, we'll see this later with Set, um, who's gonna have his moment in, in just a little bit. That thing of like anticipating the landing by extending the legs down towards the ground. That's something you do on human characters. That wouldn't really happen on a car like that, like the wheels are not so much heavier than the rest of the car that they start to fall faster than the body of the vehicle. And yet, 
witness the car reaching towards the ground like a person in order to absorb the shock um, of the landing. Like, that's very cartoony animation, actually. And again, you can also see a little bit of coyote time happening here where the car reaches its apex height and then it just kind of floats there. Like, gravity doesn't really start to affect it until here. And you can even see that the car is stretching a little bit, right? Like, you can see that the side of the car stretches out a little bit, anticipating the landing, and then, like, rattling around on its wheels as it comes down. Like, that's just... Mm, that's just really... Because getting that kind of technical... Anima like, animating a technical object like that, like a, a rigid technical like mechanical object like that you know by applying principles from like character animation that you would do to to like physical characters like that like to um, biological characters it's harder than you think like it's very easy to get that that wrong and make the car look like it's made out of rubber but in this shot perfect completely unnoticeable if you're not looking for it but it gives it that little bit of extra elasticity that little bit of extra life in his animation, um, that I think just makes it look so damn good. Another lovely shot of the dog, and here we really get to appreciate the texture work that's being done on this thing, like the way the textures are used to emphasize the expression of the dog, the way the eyebrows go from these small, tiny, squished together things, then we stretch them out, boom, and we get this huge, doe-eyed, terrified, worried expression from the poor dog. I also love this, like, as the dog goes from its, like, lowered, angry guard dog position to being shocked. Do you see that? Like, that little curvature of its little doggy legs as they kind of slide in and it kind of goes, oh! <laughs> and the jowls flapping around. This dog is so well animated. I love this dog so much. It's so good. Cassante doing his handbrake turn. Boom. And again, this is, like, this is one of those shots... It goes by so fast. And I wish the music video had had the time to take just a little bit longer on this moment of like, the dog showing up. Like, Cassante is like, haha, everything's cool, I'm confident. And he sees the dog and he's like, oh! And then the dog is like, I am angry and I'm gonna bite you. And oh no, that's a car! And then Cassante going, I can handle this. Like, if it had only had like five seconds longer, well, not five, like, not even five seconds, one and a half, two seconds longer of time to really make those those comedic beats land. Ooh, I think that would have been so good, but it's operating on such a compressed time scale that this entire scene, the first couple of times I watched it, it didn't register to me how good the comedic animation is here because it just, there, that's it, it's gone now. I barely got to look at it. I barely got to appreciate like the expressiveness of Kisante as he sees the dog is there. The expressiveness of the dog, the way the jowls are, like, vibrating and flapping around on its little mouth. Like, the, the lovely little bit of texture work going on on its lower lip, sort of replicating that rubber-like texture of, like, a of like a really big dog's, like, black gums or black lips or whatever. It's like, if it had only had a moment more, right? But even in the brief time that the boys have been in this goddamn car, they've already found time to scribble all over it with their fucking markers. <laughs> anyway... Big swooping action shot. Again, the jowls of the dog, brilliantly animated. Slobber flying out of the side as the boys crash into another building. And then we get a shot where they do take a little bit of time. Like this little slow motion shot of Cassante having a great time ramming his car into the side of theirs, like reaching over and grabbing onto it. Kane having the absolute fucking time of his life. He's, he's just enjoying himself so much. And poor little Ezreal caught in the middle, just trying not to lose his, his John Lennon glasses. Oh, poor baby boy. And once again, back to like boys being boys being silly. I do love that they're doing donuts around the ring. Like that, like Set is doing his whole like walking out like the champ Set versus the big bad robot thing going on, like on the big Jumbotron, walking out like he's the fucking boxer or wrestler making his entrance while his idiot friends are doing donuts in an ice cream truck <laughs> around the ring. It's it's wonderful. It's lovely. Like it the whole boxing intro thing that Set has got going on, like all that confidence, all that bluster. As he, like, makes the jump over in the car, we get this just banger of a flash frame, right? This is, like, fully some anime shit. Like, this is, like, boom. Pow! Like, Set is not just jumping off of this car. He's exploding off of it. It seems like it seems like way too much for what the shot is actually trying to do, but they went hard on all of these flashes. 
and all of this scribbling. Like, damn, like that's a hell of a lot. But we get to coyote time as Set jumps into the air and just kind of decides to stay there for a while. He likes it in the air. The air is nice. Uh, we can just hang out here for a bit until his legs decide that it's time to find the ground and kiss it. Zoop. <laughs> as Noodle Boy gets... He doesn't fall to the ground. He gets dragged to the ground by the weight of his own legs. Bouncing him forwards into the ring, which is like... That's just lovely, isn't it? It's like it's maybe a little bit too much. Like even at full speed here, you can kind of tell that that's something weird is going on with the gravity here, and that he's like he's not really falling. He's going like zoop. He's like magnetizing to the ground and getting pulled down. But it works in the moment, right? Like because it 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 really does emphasize like the the big moment of set, like landing in the ring, getting ready to punch, and then we get this glowing eye effect where they use the trail to sort of emphasize the speed of his motion and we get this one shot like these like one two three three frames of set with glowing yellow cat eyes as he's like darting around the ring which i quite enjoyed again boys being boys i really love this shot because like this is Ezreal giving sets entrance a rating like 10 out of 10 and kane sitting there like yeah it's my boy way <laughs> Like, that's what makes it charming is that in all the shots where these boys get to interact, where they get to be around each other, get to be together, get to do stuff, they seem to really like each other. They seem to have fun with each other. They're playing with each other. They have a lot of interaction with each other. And in that sense, they are very different from KDA, which was often the way that it was put together. Very, like, these were pop stars. Like, these were visible images of perfection that sort of barely touch each other. Um that like have had like a very different vibe of interaction, a very different vibe of the emotionality that they display towards each other. Where this is just like boys being like, ah, yeah, that's my guy, <laughs> which, which I just find so charming. Like it's a it's a very charming vision of like of like sort of friendly masculinity with one another that I that I really enjoy. Also, again, the fucking texture work on set here. Again, this is the thing of like. I'm so sure that some of these textures must be custom painted for each shot because like, look how they appear on his arm. These smears that like, especially over here, you can see the smears appearing on his model. And like, I don't know how you would do that. I don't know how you would make that happen except to like hand paint a custom texture for like every few frames of the damn thing. Um, Like, I don't know how you would do that. Like, it's very, very cool. It's very different from how Arcane does it. Like, it, I don't think it's the same production technique that, like, was used for something like Arcane. Similar effects in some ways, but not quite the same as Set punch, punches a camera and Aphelios, <laughs> just with the cuntiest little eye roll. <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh my god, he's just punching things, Jesus Christ. Like... <laughs> <laughs> exasperated by his boyfriend, I see. Like, just hanging out in the corner. Very adorable. And here we get a little bit of thematic, I think. A little bit of sort of an, an idea of what is going on more deeply thematically with what the boys are doing here. Um, because if you look at the character design of the robot that Set is getting in the ring with here, it's made entirely of cameras, right? He's fighting against this physical manifestation of public perception. He's fighting against this physical manifestation of the press, essentially, of, of, of media itself. He's fighting against being perceived by these, like, cold, dead outside lenses, and I think that's in the subtext of what the music video is trying to do, is that these, the boys here with their own little handheld crappy cameras and drones are showing themselves. Like, they're showing themselves in their own terms as a counterbalance to, like, this glowing red eye of like the global media of of like pop culture itself which is like which insists on framing them and seeing them in ways that are like foreign to how they feel about themselves that are foreign to how they want to be seen um and that's a difficult fight to take like set can't actually take this robot on all by himself which is why he gets uh one hit KO'd and like the little heart thing um Come, sort of comes flying off of him. And that's why Ezreal responds by getting, like, 
by getting real passionate with it. Like, Ezreal comes running up, and we get these flashing images of, like, his new group of friends, these people that, like, have decided to take a chance on a one-hit wonder like him, and kind of goes, Oh, no one messes with my boy! Literally tearing up the ground b behind him as he's dashing forwards. We get this, I love this shot so much. The foot coming down, we get this fully, like, rubber shit as, like, the compression behind his leg as he, like, takes the step, smashes the ground, like, crack! You can see that snap as the ground gives way between the mighty force of his leap into the air. And he shoots like this, whatever. Like, it's his ultimate, but, like, what it's meant to represent here would be specifically, like, inspiration or belief or... You know, giving support to his boy, who, with the strength that comes from having friends, with the strength that comes from having this group of people around him, is able to absolutely fucking decimate, right? Literally doing a One Punch Man reference here, by the way. Um, this is Saitama's serious punch. They're, li they're referencing that shot from One Punch Man. <laughs> um... Like, that's literally what they're doing here, and I, I quite love that, because again, you won't catch this in full speed. But that is a One Punch Man reference that then immediately transitions into much more of what I would say is like a kind of Western comics uh, visual style reference where they get these lovely hand hand drawn panels of set like smashing the daylights out of this robot, really giving you full werewolf, like really with the claws and teeth and fangs, which look great. But fucking One Punch Man reference. <laughs> in the way that the shot is framed. Like, it's specifically the way that, like, it zooms in on the, on the on the hand, and the camera rotating down, like, using the hand as a fulcrum to rotate down, looking up at the thing that's being punched. Like, that is fully, that is that, is that one shot from One Punch Man. Um, so Set literally knocks the living daylights out of uh, the evil eye of the global media, and we get a Ben-Hur reference. Of all things, a Ben-Hur reference. Like, I know there's, there's presumably a lot more movie references going on in here, but one I wouldn't have expected to see was a fucking Ben-Hur reference. Who the hell remembers Ben-Hur now? Like, I know Ben-Hur, because, like, I, I'm the kind of nerd who would who would have been exposed to that sort of thing, but, like, okay. <laughs> Kasante taking on the role of of Ben-Hur uh, with Yone and Aphelios as his steeds. And here's a thing. Um, we get this little shot as, like, as, like, Aphelios is ramping the motorcycle off and doing a backflip. We get the shot going in real close on him, real close on his eyes. And a little tiny detail that I really like is you can see that it's eyeliner, right? Like, that Aphelios, like, the, the, the way that, like, the, the black outline around his eyes, it is eyeliner. And that's a thing, like, in a lot of 3D animation, you'll get characters that are rendered with black outlines around their eyes in order to highlight their eyes, in order to make their eyes stand out more, be more visible. That here, we're shown explicitly that the reason why Aphelios has the black outlines around his eyes, it's not a stylization thing, it's because our boy wears the black eyeliner around his eyes. Like, I like that. That's just a little thing for me, is like, ah, okay, they, they, they actually paid attention to and cared about the physicality of how a character would have black outlines around their eyes in this way. Um, in a way that, like, a lot of media frankly doesn't. Like, a, a lot of media, like, it is just a stylization that's not really worried about so much. Um, so I just, I just like that as a little detail. It's just a little thing that I see and I, I thought, hey, oh, that's cool. Um, once again, pay attention to the way the wagon is animated, much like the car we talked about earlier. You see the elasticity with which it sort of jumps up and jumps around, like the wheels all skewed out from the impact of the fall as Kesante whips the thing into shape gets his little lion power effect because he is like of course the pride of Nisuma um to toil the thing which I guess is why they chose a sort of ancient Roman coliseum vibe for Kesante is because it's like oh he's like he's wrestling with this spirit of the wild animal sort of thing uh like coliseums and lions they go together quite well I guess is why we got the Ben-Hur reference <laughs> I'm still kind of baffled by it. like who in the who in the target audience for this thing would know the Ben is Ben Hur just more popular in other places? Um, I don't know. Anyway, the rest of the idiot boys come charging in in the car, and Ezreal, with his little tiny camera on a stick, is the one who's taking 
this shot of Cassante. And you can see that in the next shot, like as Ezra is like hanging out of the thing, Cassante is doing his downwards thumb thing, because again, ancient Roman reference, I guess. And it's Ezreal with his little camera on a gimbal that's like getting the shot of him driving around. And you can see our little boy out there. Like, oh, this is so cool. I'm having such a good time, guys. Oh, he's literally doing a fucking park champ face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's having such a good time. It's so lovely. They're all just enjoying each other's company so much. As it turns out that they have a passenger. And once again, just the expressiveness that these characters are rendered with. I love it. Like It's so good. They like they 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 get to have such a lot of personality here that they just don't get to have in their splash arts. And I I kind of mourn it a little bit <laughs> as the car starts like, "Oh god, oh fuck, there's a dog." Ah, bonk. <laughs> and here again, here you can really see um, the process of of like creating that extra perspective distortion because you can literally see Aphelios' arm and his hand grow as he's like reaching forward in this shot while the rest of him remains static and that's not because the focal length of the camera is changing that's because they, the animators are literally I believe anyway growing the size of his limbs in order to really hyper emphasize this like close perspective as we swing around we get a shot of Aphelios going across the moon which is that a fucking E.T. reference? It can't be right but it is a bike going across the moon like in the Amblin thing and I I can't help but feel like given the movie references that are present elsewhere that it might be and this is where we come into the bridge of the song where we get like this quiet or sort of more downplayed like like um, melodic moment in the music which gets to be Aphelios' moment where he being the composer of the group, that's theoretically the role that he's supposed to have, is that he's the composer who, like, the, creates all of the music compositions, loses his mask, right? And finally, his actual face is visible. So that, losing a mask is usually for a character design, that's a moment of vulnerability, that's a moment of opening up, that's a moment of being more present, that's a moment of, of showing something more of yourself to the world. And he dives through the water doing this beautiful light choreography thing. Um, which again, I think this is sort of supposed to reflect that Aphelios is like the composer. He's like the... the one who orchestrates the beauty of what the group is able to do, I suppose, is sort of what, what the implication of the role is. By the way, this shot is definitely a movie reference. It's a reference to something, some kind of sci-fi movie. I don't know what it is, but someone tell me in the comments. Um, and then we get Kane Cam. Which now, again, this is that thing about diegesis that I was talking about. When Kane was filming back at the very start of this heist, right? Like when the boys were running in, his camera looked fine, right? Like his, his camera didn't have all of this like 90s camcorder shit going on. Um, his camera filmed in HD as far, as far as anyone could tell. But now here in this shot, all of a sudden Kane's camera has all of this VHS distortion and camcorder nonsense going on. And I'm not really quite sure why they did that, except as a means to quickly establish that, okay, something has shifted here. Um, we're now looking, like, this is now Kane looking back at, at his new group of friends who are all, like, enraptured by Aphelios' performance. They're all looking at something other than Kane. Um, which I don't know, maybe he's jealous of that. As Aphelios continues the light show up here. And we get this shot of him, like, swooping up towards the light from above, which presumably would be from the moon, reaching out for it. And there's this moment of something that looks like it's supposed to be near transcendence for him, like supposed to be him almost grasping something that's out of his reach. And as that fails and he gets drained out of the thing, he opens his mouth and like air escapes and then he's dragged back down. And the thing about Aphelia is like his story in the fiction of Heartsteel is that he's a singer who lost his voice and became mute, right? Like, he that, that's he was a musician who completely lost his voice and became mute, and thus he became a multi-instrumentalist and, like, an immensely talented composer. And I don't know if this is supposed to be Aphelios for a moment sort of dreaming of reclaiming his voice, in a sense, and then being dragged down back to Earth by harsh reality, which Yone observes, puts on his mask, transitions into 
whatever the fuck this is. Uh, the underworld, I suppose, where a dragon with his mask on is hanging out. This is where the, the imagery gets very abstract and I can't quite parse it. I gotta be honest. Like, I'm not 100% sure what the storytelling here is supposed to be. Um, because Yone enters this spirit realm, whatever it is, uh, looking at this 2D animated, by the way, like, gorgeously, uh, 2D, I think it's a mix of 2D and 3D, maybe? Um, animated dragon sort of swooping around this pixelated view of the window into the tank where Aphelios is swimming. And then he does some computer hacking, I guess? Uh, sort of swipes his hand across a control panel. And then it falls over. Which, that, I don't... <laughs> the, 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 the logical progression of what exactly happens here, I'm not 100% sure of. But what I do know is that there's some lovely model breaking going on here. And some lovely animation smears. Look at this thing. Um, look at the way that, like, Yone's hand, like, really gets stretched and, like, manipulated. And like, oh, that looks painful. Um, to really sort of emphasize, because what he's doing here is like, obviously he's like really quick, like, like really quick swiping motions, inputting like a million commands at a second, like trying to resolve the situation, save Aphelios from something or other. Um, like being very quick and efficient with his motions. And so in order to really facilitate like that sense of snappiness, that sense of like he's going, you get all of this, like all of this smearing and then all of this breaking of the model to these like really extreme poses in order to really emphasize, like, the speed and precision with which he's working. <laughs> Even if, once you freeze frame it, it does look rather silly. <laughs> anyway, the tank falls over, because of I don't know exactly why, and the boys realize that it's time to get out of there. Oh, poor Ezreal. <laughs> it's always Ezreal who's like, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god! <laughs> who's realizing how much trouble he's gonna be in hanging out with these guys. But, his little, he does a little thing as he gets ready to teleport out. Like, again, because he's not super front and center in the shot, the animators kind of really go wild with the amount of physical distortion that they're doing on him, right? Especially here, like, just long Ezreal with the long torso because he's, like, he's starting to drop his weight down, laying the, like, laying all his weight on that foot. Which is then completed as he, like, leaps forward here. And again, a bunch of distortion happening in order to... Like, this is really fucking striking. Um, in order to, like, really heighten uh, the, the, the perspective of the shot as he drops down here. Like, look how... Look at the curvature of his back over here. Like, with the knee forward. Like, his head is essentially down next to his knee. He's bending over so much as he's, like, getting ready to make the next leap forward getting to the railing so he can jump over it. And like, really extreme posing here that just looks really fucking good. Like, look at that. Man, that's excellent. Like, by comparison, Cassante and Set, who aren't really the stars of this shot, are a lot more boring to look at, honestly. Um, because they're supposed to be. Like, Ezreal is the star here. So we get, like, a little bit from Set, like, where he sort of leaps up on this thing, kind of misses... What he's doing, you can say, oh, he sort of swings back. I'm sorry for the flashing lights, by the way. He sort of swings back and forth, like, go whoop, whoop, catches himself, leaps over and keeps going. As they all get to the railing, swing themselves over. Lots more smearing going on here. The camera swings around and whoop, this. Lovely water effect, this, by the way, because a lot of it is like hand painted, 2D painted over frame by frame of the animation, right? You can see that there's like, we've got this like white crayon textured brush thing that we're just scattering all over the thing. Underneath that is what I think is like a, a 3D physics water simulation. Not 100% sure how it works, um, but over the top of that, they have just scribbled so much texture work to like really emphasize the wild roiling waters of what's happening here. As, whoop, Ezreal gets a hold of the collar of the dog. As once again, we sort of defy physics by bursting out here, falling down. And I guess we're so buoyant that we just kind of pop out of the water again afterwards. Here's a lovely thing. Do you see that? Over there with Aphelios' foot. Like, again, poking forward into the camera. Distorting, becoming much larger than it's supposed to be in order to really emphasize that, like, rampant kicking motion that he's doing. And he's got his mask back on also somehow. Um, 
managed to catch that in, in, in the intervening time because in the interlude there where his mask was off, that feels like it was more of a metaphorical moment, sort of in terms of the visual storytelling. And then we sort of get into the more traditional music video section of the thing where it's just the boys doing pop star shit in front of like a big screen. And then we get this shot of Cassante, which again, some lovely distortions going on here on the character model, like into the frame, really emphasizing the perspective, breaking the model, sweeping out with that long ass foot as he falls down, gets caught by set, boom. And then there's this like smugness, <laughs> I can lift you and Cassante going, eh, not happy about that. And Aphelios with a little bit of a, huh, like a little bit of that head tilt like, huh, do they have something going on? Like what's going on? A little bit almost as though he thinks like, like they have a little something going on. Like just quite, sort of like sliding into shot like that, which I think is very cute. <laughs> like, like sets like <laughs> I caught you and like Cassante like I'm gonna get you back for this and Sandal's like Ur. again it even if you can't quite read exactly what's going on between them it's lovely that they have the relationship <laughs> more great expressions it's lovely that there is this sense of relationship of a dynamic between the characters um, as they interact with each other. I also quite like this shot. Again, the music video is moving so fucking fast, but I like this because because this is like a moment where I think Kane has just told a joke or something, and Cassante is kind of going like, <laughs> like he's kind of laughing at it because like Kane is distracting him by telling him something dumb and funny, um, which again in the actual music video, it goes by too fast. You can't fucking see what's happening, but it's it's those little things that I wish it had more time to focus on. Um, like those little moments of character interaction between them that sell the relationships, that make them fun to watch together. Which we also have here, right? Like where everyone's sort of sitting around with a dog, like having a good time. And is look looking over like, uh, whoa. And here comes the coolest guy in the group, Yone, with his fucking badass mask, by the way. I love the mask on this skin of Yone. Like, not everything about, like, Heartsteel Yone works for me, but the mask? The mask is really fucking good. Just flying out on his own drones. <laughs> sort of giving them a little, like, mission successful, we have the footage we need. And then, oh, there's a gate. And there's, like, cameras, stop. Again, that thing about, like, cameras being both like an enemy and a tool of the group to sort of define themselves and their own identity in some way that's like, I wish was more... Again, if the music video had a little bit more time to linger on cameras, linger on the role that perception has in the lives of these people, I think that subtext would be stronger. Like, that's something that, uh, again, comparing back to KDA, Ari's song on the EP that KDA put out, I'll show you what I made. Like, that whole music video, I have a separate animation breakdown for that one. Like, that one was very much doing the thing of, like, using crystals and refractions, which are, which are like, a huge part of KDA Ari's theme, because that's what her tail is look like, looks like. It's, like, refracting crystals, like, projecting multiple images of her to sort of explore the idea of of Ari sort of, like like, also trying to find an authentic version of herself in her pop star persona, which is part of the sub lore of the KDA universe. Um, and I kind of wish that this music video had a little bit more time to engage with that. But I do think it is it is relevant that like here at the end, Yone, who's been the guy who's been orchestrating so much, who's been the producer, who's been like taking care of things, getting all the footage, like carrying these boys, who's like the legendary producer taking a chance on this group. I do like the significance of him like taking a leap of faith off of his technology, just into the waiting arms of his new friends, right? Again, that thing about character dynamic is that these guys actually like each other. These guys actually want to hang out and, like, play with each other and find co creative collaboration with one another. And so we get this ending thing with the mug shots where, like, Yone just sort of like, seems a little bit, like, annoyed by the flash of the camera, right? Like, ugh, kind of blinks against it. Ezreal is just having a good time with his new friend. <laughs> we get Cassante and Set, once again, kind of looking like they might have a thing going on with the lovely detail that Set is holding his little thing upside down because <laughs> my boy's a himbo. Um, and finally, Kane, who's like, be sure you get my good side. <laughs> and like Yone, like having to drag him away from the camera because he's just so happy to be photographed. <laughs> 
which is a lovely detail. Like, again, the character interactions, the personalities, that's the good shit about Heartsteel. That's something Heartsteel has, I think, way more than KDA does. Um, way more than True Damage does, is that they have the sense that this is a group of boys, that it would be fun. It would be fun to tell stories about them. It would be fun to see a TV show about them. It would be fun. Like, if they were a real pop group, it would be fun to follow them. It would be fun to follow their career and hear about all the dumb bullshit that they get up to. Like, that sounds like just a good time. Anyway, uh, in summary, Heartsteel is a good time. It's a really, really fucking good music video. They deserved a better splash art. And I'm gonna stop talking now. Yeah, this was an unstructured random ramble of me. I just wanted to talk about some cool animation that I think is really good without, you know, without worrying about scripting or structuring the video at all. So if you've enjoyed that, hit the like, comment, and subscribe button down below. Uh, become a Patreon supporter if you want to. Check out my Let's Play channel. Maybe you can if you want. You don't have to. Um, follow me on Twitch. I guess. Yeah. And Riot, hey, put some put some more money towards Heartsteel. Like like these boys have a amazing character dynamics. It could be something big, but they need to have more room to breathe than just one music video. So, you know, commit to it a little bit harder, would you? Uh Yeah. Outside of that, thank you for your time and your attention for this extremely long video about an extremely short piece of animation. Remember to be kind to one another, have solidarity with those who are worse off than yourselves, and may the tides of history wash gently over us all. <laughs>